Have you ever looked at the beauty and intricacies of an animal, bird, or fish? And asked yourself, could this really have been created through a process of evolution? Could time plus chance come together and give us all the beauty we see in the world? Hi, I'm David Hames, and in the next few minutes, we're going to take a close look at some animals that are going to shatter that very idea. I want to introduce you to Dr. Job Martin. Dr. Martin has had a very interesting background. He's been a college professor and a dentist. He even served on the dental crew for President Johnson's Air Force One and the Presidential Fleet. But for the past 20 years, Dr. Martin has been lecturing students on incredible creatures that defy evolution. But it wasn't always this way. Dr. Martin, out of a scientific and medical background, once believed in the theory of evolution. Evolution, as I was taught, it all started with a thing called the Big Bang. They say this Big Bang went kaboom and shot out hydrogen gas mostly, and the gas somehow turned to dust, and the dust condensed down into planet Earth. The evolutionists say it started dry, and then over millions of years, volcanic activity produced the water, and then in some little pond of this water somewhere on planet Earth, uh, these inorganic chemicals got together and they were zapped by some kind of x-ray or something else and all of a sudden you have this little speck of life and they say that was about three and a half billion years ago and then that little speck of life somehow over about three billion years became the first cell which was somewhere around 600 million years ago and then that progressively became beautiful you. Dr. Martin's traditional scientific background would go through an evolution, rather a revolution as he joined the staff as a professor at Baylor Dental College. This was the beginning of the evolution of a creationist. And so in the fall of 1971, I went to Baylor in Dallas and gave my first lecture. It was on the evolution of the tooth. And I talked about how these fish scales gradually migrated into the mouth and became teeth. And a couple of my students came to me after class that day and said, Dr. Martin, have you ever investigated the claims of creation science? Well, that was 1971. I'd never even heard of it. At that point, I'd been a Christian for about five years. And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, where are these guys coming from? Uh, I've never heard of this. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll look into this with you. And I'm thinking, kind of as a cocky young professor, I'll blow these guys away. Well, they asked me to start studying the assumptions that the evolutionists make. And in all my years, eight years of scientific education, I had never had a single professor tell me about an assumption. And uh, so we started looking at the assumptions, and I began to realize they're making some claims here that really the assumptions aren't valid when they tell us rocks are very old and all these kinds of things. And, uh, and then they asked me to start studying some animals and see if I thought that animal could evolve. Well, the first thing that we really studied together was this little bug called a bombardier beetle. And this little insect, it's about a half inch long, and it mixes chemicals that explode. So I began to think, okay, now how would that evolve? Let's say if evolution is true, and you're evolving along here, and you don't have a defense mechanism, because that is the defense mechanism of the bug. So if evolution is true, it had to somehow evolve that. So let's say it's coming along here. Well, the first time it evolves the, the explosion, what does it do to the bug? Boom, you just splattered your bug, okay? So splattered bug pieces don't evolve. So I thought, well, how, how, how could this have happened? Well, it doesn't blow itself up. It has another little factory inside itself that manufactures chemicals, a chemical, acts as a catalyst, so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. Well, the first time it manufactured that little chemical, it, it, here it goes again, blew itself up again. But it doesn't, why? Well, because it has like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. So it has uh, like twin tail tubes. And it can aim these tail tubes all the way up, out the side, out the front. Let's say a spider is coming up toward its side and it doesn't have time to turn around and shoot. Uh, it can just take its little gun turret, and aim it out there and shoot. The, the explosion on this little bug, all you hear, if, if you're listening as a human, you hear this pop. But scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion and it's like It's like about a thousand sequential little explosions but they're so fast, all we hear is one pop. 
And so you think, well, now, why would that be? Well, that was a curious thing for the scientists that study this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University, some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes room bang and shoots it, he's gonna pop himself right out of there. It's like lighting a burner on a jet engine, and so he's out of there. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. How would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. There is no way a slow, gradual process is going to produce this bug. There's no way uh, even the newest theories of evolution, like punctuated equilibria, which means evolution happens very fast. Well, there's no way that will explain this little bug. I began to realize, how could this particular little animal, for instance, evolve? Uh, it needed all of its parts. It needed everything there all at once, or you just don't have the animal. And my stomach started to churn. If, if I really want to be honest, and my wife would tell you, my stomach churned for five years. It took a five-year struggle for me to begin to flip the way I think, from thinking in an evolutionary way to thinking in more this animal or little creature, little bug, whatever, was created uh, fully formed, just like it is, because that went against everything I'd ever learned. Did you know the world's strongest animal is actually the beetle? In fact, in one test, the rhinoceros beetle carried over 850 times its own weight on its back. That would be like me trying to carry 130,000 pounds. I don't think so. Now let's take a look at the world's tallest animal. A bull giraffe is about 18 feet tall. In order to get blood up that long skinny neck against gravity, the bull giraffe has to have a powerful pump and that's his heart. And the heart of a bull giraffe can be as much as two and a half feet long. Big, powerful pump. Now, as he's going along here, living his life, everything's just fine, but all of a sudden, this 18 foot tall creature decides, I need a drink of water. So he bends his head down to get a drink of water. Now we have a problem. Because now this powerful pump, instead of pumping against gravity, is pumping with gravity. And so the heart gives a mighty squeeze and the blood shoots down his neck, hits his brain and bursts his brain. And so now he just blew his brains out, okay? So he's dying and he must be thinking to himself, I need to evolve something here to take care of my problem. When I get a drink of water, I blow my brains out. Of course, we know dead creatures don't evolve, but he doesn't blow his brains out because as he bends his head down, there are like little spigots in his artery that goes up the neck, little valves, and they close. But the last pump is beyond the last valve. And so it's enough to burst the little arterioles in his brain, but it doesn't go into his brain. The last pump kind of goes whoop underneath the brain into like a sponge. And this sponge just gently expands and he hasn't blown his brains out and he gets his drink of water. And now he sees a zebra kind of running up from this side and he just ignores it. But he sees a lion coming up from this side. And, oh, the lion wants to eat me, I gotta get out of here. Now, how does he know the difference, by the way? Evolutionists can't explain that to us, but the fact is, here comes this lion. He's going to eat the giraffe, and so the giraffe uh, jumps up. He runs about five steps, passes out. Not enough oxygen to his brain. While he's there, passed out, the lion is eating him. Uh, he must be thinking, I, I need to evolve something here. I got this problem. I pass out when I get up too fast. And, but he doesn't, of course. Well, why? Well, because God made him so that when he begins to bring his head up, the little spigots, the little valves in the artery uh, open, the sponge under the brain gently squeezes that last little pump of oxygenated blood up into his brain. There are little valves in the vein that goes down the neck. They close, and by the time he's up and running, everything is fine, his blood pressure is fine, and he does just fine. Well, how would that evolve? He needs all of those parts, all there, all at the same time, all at once, or he's dead. And so I think the giraffe is another example of a designer. He needed a designer to design him just like he is. The tallest giraffe known was named George. He resided at the Chester Zoo in England. George was 20 feet tall to the tips of his horns, which are actually called ossicones. Here's another interesting giraffe fact. Giraffes have no vocal cords. Now here's a bird you'll see around your house, but after taking a closer look at it, you might find it unbelievable. The woodpecker is a very special little bird. The beak of a woodpecker 
is like industrial strength. It is stronger than other birds' beaks. Uh, he has special feet. Most birds have three toes out the front, one toe out the back. Woodpecker has two toes out the front, two toes out the back. And that's so he can climb around on a tree trunk, a vertical tree trunk, right side up, upside down, sideways. He can crawl any way he wants to. He has uh, special tail feathers. His tail feathers are different than other birds' tail feathers. Uh, they're more resilient, they're, they're spongy, and they're very strong and tough because he tripods himself with his two feet and his tail feathers so that he grabs a hold of that tree, fans out his tail feathers, and then bangs his head into the tree. Now you would think that a woodpecker would go home every night and say to Mrs. Woodpecker, oh, I got this headache, I was banging my head on a tree all day. But he doesn't, why? Well, because God made him with special equipment. For instance, between his beak and his skull, there's a piece of cartilage. It acts as a shock absorber. His skull is, is the thickest bone per body weight of any creature. As a matter of fact, brain surgeons study the brains of woodpeckers, how they're hooked in there and everything to help them with like trauma people in accidents that they need to put their brains back in there. And, uh, and so they study woodpeckers. The woodpecker with his strong skull and his shock absorber and his strong beak and his tail feathers and his feet, he's all ready to go except for one thing. Once he drills his hole, he's got to get that bug out of the tree because that's lunch. All right, well, how's he going to do that? Well, most birds, their tongue goes right to the tip of the beak. A woodpecker's tongue goes as much as 10 inches out of his beak. Now why? Well, because he's going to drill the hole, find the bug tunnel down in the tree, stick his tongue down in the tunnel, and drag the bug out. Now you would have to say, could I stick my tongue down a hole in a tree and drag a bug out? Of course not. Well, how does the woodpecker do that? Well, God made the woodpecker with little barbs on the tip of his tongue. And he will literally stab that bug larva down in there because it doesn't want to come out. But in case that's not enough, he has a little glue factory in his tongue that manufactures exactly, precisely the right glue to stick to the bug, but it doesn't stick to his beak. And so he pulls that bug into his mouth. Now we have a problem, if evolution is true. Let's say over hundreds of thousands of years, this woodpecker got all this equipment and then he glues his tongue to a bug and he swallows the bug. What just happened to his tongue? He just swallowed his tongue. You know, he dies, he just strangled himself, okay? But he doesn't, why? Well, because as he brings the bug into his mouth, he has another little factory that manufactures the solvent to dissolve the glue. So he dissolves the glue, loosens up the bug, swallows the bug. God made him that way. Woodpeckers, when they peck, they open their eyes between each peck and they aim their beak, they focus, they aim their beak, they close their eyes, and then they hit the tree. So you hear a woodpecker out there, he's going drrr, drrr. Every time you hear that drrr, in between each peck, he opens his eyes, focuses, aims his beak, hits the tree. Why? Well, they used to think it was just to keep the wood chips out, but now the scientists have measured the, the force of the impact of the woodpecker's head against the tree, and the force is so great that if he did not close his eyes, he would pop his eyeballs out. So I would say, have you ever seen a blind woodpecker? No, they never miss, they never miss, okay? Now, one special woodpecker, the European green woodpecker. I think he's unique in all the animal kingdom. I don't know for sure, but I think he might be. His tongue is different than any other tongue, as far as I know. Our tongue starts in the back of our throat, comes up and out the front. His tongue starts in the back of his throat, goes down the throat, comes out the back of his neck, up over the top of his head, it's under the skin, comes out a little hole between his eyes, goes in one of his nostrils, and then comes out of his beak. And you'd have to say, now how does that evolve? I've asked evolutionists that question. I've said, now you tell me, how and where did that tongue come from? They, they don't have a clue. They can't tell me. I'm saying, well, you're telling me that this bird evolved from some other creature, but there's no other creature that we know of with a tongue like that. How did that happen? They don't have any idea. So what could I say as a creationist? I would say God made that little woodpecker and I think he made that woodpecker to challenge the evolutionary community because as they study that little bird, they know there is no way this little thing could evolve. But it goes right back to that Romans 1 passage that as men study the creation, it says they study what God has made, because they are unrighteous, they will suppress evidence. They will hold back evidence. And I think that's exactly what happened. I think there are very bright people who study science and do a good job of it. But all of a sudden they get to a point where they have to decide, did this thing happen 
uh, over long periods of time somehow, or boy, it sure looks like it could have happened just bang, just like it is. And then if they discover, hey, I have no way of describing this thing in terms of evolutionary science, they're faced with the other option, which is maybe a designer and a creator, and they say, I don't want to go that way, okay? So they suppress that evidence. And so many of the things that I studied, we had to search just to find information on them because they are not in the textbooks. They just don't put them in because they have no way to explain it. And so they just ignore it. Another bird that got Dr. Martin's attention lives down under, mate, in Australia. There's a little bird in Australia. It's called the Australian incubator bird. Uh, some people call it the mound builder. Uh, sometimes it's called the brush turkey. And there's different species. We'll talk about one in particular. But this little bird, about three and a half to four pounds, the female has two jobs. Her first job is to check out the nest and see if it's going to be okay. The male builds the nest and then the female checks it out. Now you would say, well, big deal. She's gonna check out the nest. Well, this nest is not like any other nest. Some of these nests have been measured at 20 feet across and as much as 50 feet high. And some of them dig down into the dirt three to six feet. So it's like a huge, that's why they're called the mound builders. It's like a huge mulch pile. So she comes and she digs down in there and she comes out and says to Mr. Bird, uh, I don't like this one. And so he says, okay, hang on for a couple months. I'll build you another one. Okay, so he builds her another one. Let's say she likes this one. Now she goes to job number two. And that is uh, she lays eggs. Now she lays one egg every three days for seven months. And it's a little three and a half to four pound bird and the, the eggs are almost a half pound each. They're almost as big as an ostrich egg. Impossible, impossible. She's dead, she, I mean, you can't do that, okay? But she does. Now, this one species, the female makes a very thick shell on the eggs, and it has pores. All birds' eggs have pores, that's how they breathe, but this one, the pores are shaped like little ice cream cones, and the tip of the ice cream cone is in toward the inside of the shell. So as the chick begins to develop inside the shell, uh, he gets to a certain day and he can't get enough air. He's going, uh, 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 I can't get enough air. And so he begins to shave off, scrape off the inside layer of the shell. And that uh, makes the holes bigger. He's going up the ice cream cone, so now he can breathe. And so he does that all the way along till he finally breaks out of the shell. Now the male bird takes care of the nest. The female, once she lays the eggs, she just goes off and now he takes care of the nest. Now you would say, well, is that a big problem? Well, yes, because each species has some different qualifications for the nest. And this one I'm going to talk about, the male keeps the nest at 91 degrees Fahrenheit for seven months. And if it varies by much more than a degree on either side of 91 degrees Fahrenheit, the chicks die. So Daddy Bird is out there every day. He digs down into the nest and he checks the temperature and the scientists aren't even exactly sure how he does the temperature, but he checks the temperature. Oh, it's 92 degrees, it's too hot, I gotta do something. So he runs back up and sometimes he'll throw sand on top to try and uh, reflect more sunlight or he has various things he'll do. Uh, he also keeps that nest at about 99.5% humidity. If it gets down to about 80%, the chicks dry out, the eggs dry out. He has to keep it at roughly 99% humidity. So 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 99% humidity. That's impossible for a th little three and a half pound, four pound bird. When the chick uh, hatches out of its egg, uh, it has all of its feathers. It, uh, as far as I know, it's the only bird that it's ready to fly, but it can't fly because it's down deep in a big mulch pile. Now, nobody feeds this little bird. Dad doesn't feed the bird. Mommy bird doesn't feed the little baby. They come out of the egg and then they somehow know, I gotta get out of here. So they turn over on their back and they begin to scrape the sticks and leaves on top of them and it'll drop down on their chest and they shake it off their chest, pack it down with their little wings, dig some more, falls down, shake it off, pack it down. It takes up to three days for them to dig out of the nest. And nobody told them to do that. Nobody told them to go. Wh which way? Which way do I go? But how do they know that? You see, well, evolution can't explain those kinds of things. All right, so here it comes. He's out of the nest. Nobody shows it what to eat. He goes off, he knows what to eat, he knows how to catch it and find it. And then the next year, the male bird is gonna build a nest. But Daddy Bird didn't show him how. He starts building a mound all by himself. Nobody showed him how to do it. It's a miracle, it's just a miracle.
And so you look at even something like a little Australian incubator bird and you say, how could that evolve? If, the, if, if this story of evolution is true, how could that happen? I say, only God could do that. Here's something most of us pull out of the icebox every morning. If you take an egg and you put it in warm water, you will see bubbles coming out. Now, why do you see those bubbles? Well, because there's little holes all through the egg shell, about 10,000 actually in a chicken shell. Those holes are there so that the chick can breathe, because that's where he gets his air, through those holes, so they can get the waste out of the shell, because the chick, as he develops, is going to eat the yolk, and the yolk, as he burns it up, there's waste products, there's water and different things given off, and he has to be able to get the waste out of the shell, or, or for instance, just the amount of water that's given off, he would drown right there in the shell. How do you explain all the intricate mechanisms and the perfect timing that it takes for an egg to develop, making this whole thing happen? Because every step of the way, the chick would be dead. Everything has to be done on a particular day and in a particular order, and the timing has to be exactly right, or you have a dead chick. If you have ever boiled an egg or eaten a hard-boiled egg, you'll notice when you peel the egg, there's like that little membrane in there. And that membrane has to be there, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But on one end of the egg, it's flat. And it looks like the chicken didn't quite fill the egg. Well, that's a special place. That's called the air sac. And so now we take all these parts and we put them together and we have this little fertilized egg. And now this little chick is developing. By the fifth day, its little heart is pumping. Blood vessels have grown out of the chick. Uh, two of them go up, hook into the membrane. And those are the ones that it's going to breathe through. It'll get its air through that. Uh, the air comes through the pores or the holes in the shell up to the membrane. And then the membrane transfers the oxygen uh, to the artery, the vein that goes into the chick. And then the other uh, vessel that hooks into that uh, gets rid of the waste. And so there's a process there of things coming in and things going out of the shell. Uh, two more blood vessels hook into the yolk. And that's the way the chick eats. And as he lives in this shell, he begins to uh, get to where he's too big and he can't get enough air and it's now the 19th day. Now during this time he has grown a little tooth on top of his beak. It's called the egg tooth. Now most of us grow our teeth inside our mouth, not on our beak, but the little chick has this little egg tooth. And on the 19th day uh, he takes that and he pokes a little hole into that flat end of the egg where the air is. That's called the air sac. And now he has six hours to breathe. Now, if we're swimming and we're on the bottom of the swimming pool and we've run out of air and we get up to the top and we ah, oh, I just made it. We usually just sit there and lean there and get some good air and breathe a while. Well, not the chick, because if he got into that air sac, I mean, he's going, uh, uh, I can't get enough air. And he pecks into that on the 19th day, not one day sooner or one day later, or it's dead, but it's the 19th day, goes into that sac. Now he's got six hours. Now, is he gonna just sit there and breathe that air? Or is he going to say, I need to do something else with this air? Which is what he says, I've gotta get a little hole and use this six hours of air. I got six hours to peck a little hole through the shell. And now he breathes from the 19th to the 21st day through this little hole in the shell. On the 21st day, that's the day he breaks out of the shell. Now, in the meantime, the systems that hook into the membrane and the systems that hook into the yolk, all of those little vessels, they begin to disattach or deattach themselves. And when he comes out of the shell, sometimes he might have a blood vessel hanging on him somewhere or something like that. But the fact is, these things, it's like he's dropped his space suit off and he is ready to go. And so he comes out of that shell on the 21st day, but every single step along the way had to have perfect timing. It had to be done exactly right. And when he comes out, he's a discrete entity. There's, there's no mistake, this is a chick. All we see in all of nature, in the fossil record and in living creatures, is just discrete, uh, identifiable. We can label them, that's a cow, that's a chicken. And so I think that's more evidence that God made everything, including little chicks, just exactly like they are. Wow, breakfast is not gonna look the same. Did you know in an official test at the University of Missouri, chicken number 2988 laid 371 of these things in just a year. It's a lot of eggs. You know there are animals that breathe air. However, they seem more at home in the water. Take the beaver for instance.
The beaver is uh, amazing because it's an engineer. They build their beaver dams with engineering skill. As a matter of fact, engineers study beaver dams to see how to build strength into a dam and to see how to channel water. It's like the beaver knows all this. And, and so our engineers go to college and then they study what the beaver. It's like the brain surgeon studying the woodpecker. It's like God gave us examples in his creation of how to do things right. Well, anyway, a beaver uh, builds his house and he usually has a couple of entrances coming in under the water, and he makes his house in such a way that the bad gases uh, that build up in there can escape, uh, oxygen can come in, but he builds it in such a way that it will stay dry in there. And so they can have little baby beavers in there, and they have a nice, dry, clean place to be. Uh, he will store food in the bottom of the stream or the river, and that means he has to be underwater frequently. Well, in the winter, where most beavers live, it gets very cold. Has God made a provision for that? Oh yes, he sure has. A beaver goes underwater. He has like transparent eyelids, water goggles, and he can see through his eyelids under the water. And that's to keep the dirt out of his eyes that's floating around. Uh, he has nose flaps that close, keeps the water out of his nose. Ear flaps that close, keeps the water out of his ears. He has a special thing that I like. He has fur-lined flaps in the back of his mouth that cover his throat and his molars, his big teeth in the back. Now his front teeth, they must not be sensitive because uh, those are the ones that he uses to chew down and, and chew through the trees and they wear down and they keep growing and he'll wear them off, they keep growing. And so they must not be sensitive, but his back teeth are. And so God made him little fur lined flaps to protect them from the cold ice water in the winter time. And then you, you think about the way a beaver swims and he can take a branch that has a load, a drag on it and he can swim across even a stream with a current and he wants to come over here, and, but he's over here and there's a, a current and he's dragging uh, a branch and he can go right straight across there, he'll compensate. So he's making mathematical calculations and he is figuring out what kind of rudder action he needs with his tail to compensate for the drag and for the, and the current in the stream and he gets to where he wants to go every single time. I don't think evolution has an explanation for that, but I think my God does. Another animal is the duck-billed platypus. And this animal is fascinating. It's similar to a beaver in that it spends a lot of its time in water, has webbed feet and lays eggs. Kind of strange for a mammal. But anyway, the thing that is fascinating is the way it finds its food. A platypus eats little tiny shrimp that it finds under the water. But when it goes in the water, unlike the beaver, which has clear eyelids, the platypus closes his eyes he has nose flaps that close, so he's not seeing anything, he's not smelling anything. So how does he find the shrimp? He has inside of himself a mechanism that detects the electrical impulses in the tail of the shrimp between the muscle and the nerve. When the nerve sends an impulse to the muscle, there's a tiny little electrical impulse, and the platypus reads that electrical impulse, and that is what leads it to its food. They have done experiments where they have put dead shrimp in a tank, with flashlight batteries. And the platypus will go to the flashlight battery because there's, a, there's an electrical current there. So he finds his food by reading the electrical currents, those tiny little electrical currents. That's a miracle, absolute miracle. I don't know about you, but I am no fan of spiders. Which gets me thinking, how could something so creepy and crawly be incredible? There's a spider that we have down in Texas, and it's other places around the United States, called the black and yellow garden spider. Some people call it the zipper spider because in the middle of its web, it always makes a little characteristic mark. It's like a little zipper of floss that it makes. And this spider is just amazing. We raised some of these spiders. We don't raise them, they just grow there at our house. And so we watch them and we feed them things like grasshoppers and crickets. And, and they have uh, seven different kinds of webbing that they make they make a certain kind of webbing that is not sticky. And that is what they will run out on their web to catch a little bug. Uh, they have another kind of webbing that is sticky, that catches the bugs. And these webs are not small. A garden spider, a full-grown female spider, probably has a web about two feet across. She's going to be, oh, about two, two and a half inches across. And uh, 
They'll do interesting things. If you get up very close to them, when they're just quietly sitting there on their web, sometimes they will start making their web shake like a trampoline. It'll come out at you. And it's, they're saying, get away from me. I don't want you near me. Uh, but then when they catch a bug, they'll run out and they'll catch this bug and they shoot sheets of webbing. And they'll spin that bug around and shoot sheets out, not just little fine strands. And I think that's fascinating how they can control that. They know I need a sheet of webbing for this job, whereas I need a strand of webbing for this job. I need a strand of sticky webbing for this job. They know what they want to do. Some of them, after they're born, the little spiderlings, and as a matter of fact, uh, the female will put, oh, 30 to 55 eggs in her little egg sac. Another interesting thing, she makes this egg sac out of different kinds of webbing. And she'll spin this little sac and then she wraps it with a flossy kind of, of webbing. And ultimately, she'll spin a, almost a tannish brown color webbing. So she even has different colors of webbing. But she fills this egg. You'd think she'd fill it from the top. She fills it from the bottom. She goes under it and puts her eggs up in it. And then each egg she will dust with like a fine powdery dust, which is another little factory she has in herself so that the eggs don't stick to each other. And she'll push all those eggs up in there and then seal the bottom. And sometimes she'll do this in the fall. And we have one of these at our house right now that's sitting there. And, it, and next spring, the eggs will hatch out. So it sits there all winter long. And uh, so sometimes these little spiders, when they hatch out, they decide, I think I want to go to Acapulco. I don't know what they think, but they, they'll come out and they'll shoot out uh, streamers of webbing and wait for the wind to catch it. And then they'll let go of the web and the wind picks them up. And people have found these spiders as much as 15,000 feet up in the air. They have traced them 1,500 miles flying. I think that's fascinating. How does a spider decide, today I'm going to take a trip. I'm going to throw out the webbing and I think I need to go somewhere else. But that's how they spread themselves around. And another interesting thing is as they grow, their shell doesn't grow. They have like an outside shell. So they have to uh, get out of there. And if they don't, they die. Well, how are they going to get out? Well, they have a little factory inside themselves that makes exactly, precisely the right uh, fluid. It's called molting fluid. So that they can, on a certain day, they squirt this molting fluid in a certain place on their shell. It has to be the right place. And it dissolves the shell and makes like a little trap door. And so they can push that little trap door up, crawl out of that shell, and then they start growing a new one. And they do, they molt several times as they're growing. Well, you would say, now, let me think a minute. If evolution is true, how would a spider uh, be able to develop this little factory to make the molting fluid so that it can dissolve the shell? So it has to be the right fluid, so it will be the right thing to dissolve the shell, but it has to dissolve it in the right place or it still can't get out. And all of that has to happen on exactly the right day or the spider dies inside the shell. So survival of the fittest. We should not have black and yellow garden spiders. Now, some people see those big spiders and they, they like to squash them. And, and I say, let's let those little things live. They, they, they eat other harmful bugs and different kinds of things and, and they're a pretty spider and they're fun to watch. And so God has made his creatures and his creation so that we will study it and study it carefully. And then the whole idea is, as we study it, we will give him thanks and give him glory. And I think that's, that's how we ought to study the things that God has made. Maybe spiders aren't so bad after all. How come I didn't learn any of this in school? I have some more studying to do. Down in southwest United States of America, we have different kinds of lizards, and a couple of those are very interesting. One of them, called the gecko lizard, has some very special characteristics. Its feet. Now, if you have a little pet gecko lizard, and they're friendly little things, you can watch that. It'll run right across your ceiling. You could have a ceiling made of glass and it'll just run right across the ceiling. It doesn't fall off. Gravity does not pull it off. And, and so the scientists for many years, they just didn't know what makes that lizard be able to stick like it does. So they took its feet, which are a special kind of feet, and, and they magnified the feet. And they discovered on these feet, there are like little hairs, little tufts of hairs. And 
So they thought, well, that's not enough. And that was with 2,000 magnifications. And they said, well, that's not enough. Uh, there's something else here. So they put it under phase electron microscope, these little hairs, and they kept magnifying them and magnifying them. They got up to 35,000 magnifications, and all of a sudden, there was the answer. All over these little hairs are tiny little suction cups, but you have to magnify them 35,000 times just to see the, the suction cup. Now, these suction cups are so powerful that if the foot was not made in a special way, when that gecko, let's say, put his foot up against the ceiling, it would just suck it right up against there, and he's stuck. He's not moving. So his foot had to be made in such a way that he can use other parts of his foot to pop loose those suction cups. So what he'll do is, and if you look at the foot of a gecko, it, it looks different than a, a normal lizard. Most lizards have kind of finger-like with big nails on them. And the gecko, though, has like these little rounded uh, pads on its foot. And it can take those feet, and they're almost kind of rounded on the bottom, so that it can, for instance, use the suction cups in the front to pop up the ones in the back. Or it can use them on the side to pop up the other side. And so it just does it naturally, but that's what's going on. How would a lizard evolve little 35,000 times it takes to see the magnifications, how would it evolve that? And why would it evolve that? And why would it have the right kind of a foot that has to be there if it's going to have those suction cups? All of that had to be there all at once. And then we have this other lizard. He's called the Chuckawalla lizard. And he has really three different distinctives that make him special. One of them is uh, he has almost like a blanket across his back of skin. And this skin changes color. He'll start out in the morning and it'll be dark. And that means it absorbs more sunlight because he's a cold-blooded animal and he needs to be able to get his blood warmed up so he can run away from his enemies and things. And so it'll warm him up. But later on in the afternoon, in the desert, when the sun is really hot, it turns a light beige color and it reflects the sun so that his blood doesn't boil. Now he has a defense mechanism. Let's say a coyote wants to eat one of these little lizards, and they do try to eat these lizards. Uh, he will run into it like a crack in the rocks, and he expands his body kind of like a blowfish. He will blow his body up, and he's now stuck in there, and they can't get him out. There's no way to pull it out of there. It just kind of conforms to the cracks in there, his defense mechanism. But the thing I like about the chuckwalla lizard is his desalination factory. Now that means he has too much salt in his blood. Why? Well, because he lives in the desert and there's no water, so he doesn't have anything to drink. So as he eats plants and little animals, little insects, he begins to build up salt. And as the salt builds up, it's enough to kill him. Now, when does he know he has too much salt? Well, when he gets too much salt, what does that do? It kills him. So survival of the fittest, you see, he's out of here, but he's not, why? Because God made a little factory in his nose. It's a little desalination factory. It's a little factory that will, as the blood builds up salt, all of a sudden he thinks, I think I need to get the salt out of my blood. I think I'll run it through my factory. So he shunts the blood. He detours the blood through this little factory. And that little factory takes the salt out of his blood. Now every now and then, the chuckwalla lizard, he goes, achoo, and he sneezes pure salt crystals. Now, I think you could take a chuckwalla lizard, put him on your dining room table, and say, okay, Chuck, we need a little salt here. And there you go. We've got pure salt from a lizard's sneezes. I think that's incredible. He is another one of the incredible creatures that our Lord has made. What's the most complex creature? It has to be you and me. But how did we get here? Are we distant cousins to the apes? Or were we designed by a creator? And if so, is the Bible's account of creation actually possible. If we look at the Genesis account of God's creation of man, he says he made man fully mature. Adam, when we first meet him, full grown, full grown man, only one minute old. It says he took a rib and made Eve. Now some Christian people say, I can have evolution, I can have the Bible. Well now we have a problem. Are there any evolutionists that teach that women evolve from ribs? Well, of course not. But that's what the Bible says. It says God took a rib and made Eve. Now, when Adam wakes up from his anesthetic and sees Eve, she's full grown. She's uh, two seconds old, but she's full grown. If we believe the biblical account, we have to believe God will create full grown creatures of which man is one of those creatures. I might add, 
Can our Creator do that kind of thing? The Bible tells us in three places, Jesus is the Creator. Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, John 1. So Jesus is the Creator. Well, then He created man full grown, had the appearance of age, He was fully mature. It, woman, full grown, fully mature. Trees, full grown. Peaches on them. Eve could have eaten a peach. Adam, how long does it take to grow a peach like that? Three days, Eve. Well, that can't be. Yes, God made the tree with the right fruit three days ago. If we're going to believe the creation account, as Genesis puts it, we have to believe that. Now, did Jesus the Creator have the ability to do that? Well, what are His miracles? His first miracle, John 2, turns water into wine. He used six water pots, it says in John chapter 2, and when the head waiter tasted that water, he said, well, this is the best wine. Well, how do you make good wine? We have to age it. Well, how old is it? One minute old. How many water pots? Six. How many days in the creation week? Six. Creation with the appearance of age in Genesis 1. Creation of wine with the appearance of age in John chapter 2. I don't think that's an accident. Now, how did he make man? Well, let's, let's just think about our ear. First of all, you look at a human ear and you think, that's a strange thing. I mean, we have these things that are here that, and then you look at the animals and they all have ears. And, and yet not all animals do. Many animals hear without ears, uh, but we have ears. Now the human eardrum is just a marvel. It moves such a small amount that you really can't measure it. Some scientists have said the movement of the eardrum with the different sounds hitting it is about the same as one one hundredth the width of a hydrogen molecule. That's one of the smallest molecules. So that little teeny bit of movement can tell the difference between a trumpet, a bass drum, uh, your mother telling you to go make your bed, uh, your daddy telling you you can't have the car tonight because you didn't get in on time last night, and that little bit of movement differentiates between all those different sounds and then goes right into our brain, and our brain tells us, this is mama talking, this is daddy speaking, this is the, the symphony orchestra, and we can hear music. We can hear someone say, I love you, which we all love to hear. How? With just not even the width of a hydrogen molecule of movement. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. And that's right there inside of our head. Our eye, same kind of a thing. I mean, scientists have not been able to duplicate what our eye does. They cannot make a lens on a camera, and I imagine photographers would like to have a lens like that, that it sees clearly far away. It sees clearly up close. If we're talking a, a good eye, not one that has pathology or, or it needs glasses, the eye is constantly, it's like this. It's vibrating all the time. And yet the images that we see, they aren't doing this. They are steady. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's the way God put the whole eye together with the various muscles that are in there and the ways that it contacts through your ophthalmic nerve and goes to your brain and and we see things and the image is flipped and they've done experiments where they put glasses on people and they flip everything upside down and within two weeks time a, per, a person with those kind of glasses can drive a car and his brain is compensated for all that and you think of just the way the human body works how would that evolve now when we think about this we've looked at quite a few creatures and you look at those things and you start to think, how could that be? Is that the result of an impersonal uh, chance, random process? Or could it be there's actually a designer, some power that had the genius to design all of these little things so that they actually work? and every part works with all the other parts. And it all comes out with these marvelous creatures that defy evolution in every single way. I think it proves that there is a designer. And I think I know his name. And I think he wants to have a relationship with each one of us. And I think he's penetrated his time and his space in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the designer and the maker, who has the power and has the genius to do all of this. Well, there you have it. Animals are a lot more complex and interesting than I realized. Dr. Martin has a point. The next time you look at all this beauty, realize that this is no accident.